Support the show on Patreon and gain unique perks like an armchair historian coloring book, uniform guide, profile pictures, or wallpapers. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. In our previous D-Day from the Bird's Eye Perspective video, we examined the British landings at Gold and Sword Beach from a top-down view. We saw how the German beach defenses in both landing zones were, for the most part, quickly overcome against relatively few casualties. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for the landing zones of the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division at Juneau Beach. In our final episode in this series, we'll fly across the Juno sector from the bloody struggle for its seaside towns to the daring dash for Copiquet Airfield and the paris cherbourg railway line. As a creator and business owner with a busy schedule, finding time to prepare a home-cooked meal is challenging to say the least. But thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Factor 75, fully cooked, convenient, and healthy meals are now just a few clicks away. Factor saves you time and effort by cutting out meal planning and preparation, so meals come together in minutes, taking the guesswork out of what to make for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Arriving conveniently at your door pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes or less, Factor's flexible and healthy meal preference options like keto, calorie smart, and vegan, as well as more than 27 plus menu options each week, mean that there are choices for everyone. And their no-hassle prepared foods make sure you always have something tasty and nutritious on hand when you don't have time to think about making lunch or dinner. Use my link or go to gofactor75.com and use code P-O-G-T-A-H-M-A-R-50 for 50% off your first box. Once you click, my description will like Live update to count up the purchases. Stretching around 8 kilometers from Saint Aubin sur Mer in the east to Corsol sur Mer in the west, Juno Beach was situated in between the British sectors of Gold and Sword. Its most significant landmark was the Capique Airfield, located some 17 kilometers inland just to the west of the city of Caen. Allied planners had made it a priority to expand Allied air superiority as soon as possible, and the capture of Capique was deemed an important first step to achieve this goal. The Canadian 3rd Infantry Division had been assigned to assault up the beach, seize the airfield, and sever the paris cherbourg railway line. If possible, the 3rd Infantry Division would also support a potential assault on Caen, with British forces advancing from Sword Beach. Like their British comrades in arms, the Canadian Invasion Force would face units of the German 716th Static Infantry Division, which had positioned themselves in pillboxes and fortified houses in various fishing villages along the coast. The most formidable of these resistance nests were located in bernier sur mer and saint aubin sur mer whose large vacation homes provided the defenders with excellent vantage points over the beach, while skillfully positioned gun emplacements could pick off approaching armor at range. Elsewhere, on-rails machine gun teams had the ability to rapidly reposition their heavy equipment to suppress large sections of the beach. At dawn, the Allied Armada offshore opens fire on the German batteries and strongpoints in the Juno Beach sector, as the men of the Canadian 7th and 8th Brigades ready themselves to open the assault on the beach. At 7.30, the first landing craft set off from their assembly points, but the rough waters of the channel quickly slow the advance to the beach. The Germans, in the meantime, have suffered only minor damage from the opening bombardment as they prepare themselves to meet the first wave with withering fire. At around 7.50, landing craft carrying engineer elements of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles are the first to lower their ramps in the Mike sector near Corsol sur Mer, while delayed elements of the Queen's Own and Royal Regina Rifles are closing in further to the east in the Nan sector. 
many of the amphibious duplex drive tanks of the first Hussars that were supposed to come ashore alongside the infantry faltered in the channel waters, with only 14 arriving on the beach intact. Lacking adequate armor support, the Winnipeg's men are mercilessly cut down by intense German fire. Further to the west, other elements find the German strongpoints opposing them greatly weakened or already destroyed by the preliminary bombardment. After a brief firefight, the few remaining positions are neutralized as the Canadians begin to advance inland. Further to the east, in the NAN sector, the Regina rifles similarly manage to silence most of the initial German defenses in front of the Corsol Sumer in rapid succession, and by 8 o'clock, its men are already advancing into the town itself. Its abandoned vacation homes, however, provide ample opportunity for the Germans to transform its quaint streets into a veritable killing zone forcing the Reginas to begin the time-consuming task of clearing out enemy snipers and makeshift strongpoints one by one. Just a few kilometers to the east, the Queen's own rifles are facing another type of nightmare in front of Bernier Sumer. Sandbars and other obstacles obstruct the way to the beach, forcing the Queen's own to wade through deep water before making a near suicidal dash across 183 meters of beach without armored support. Crossfire from several hidden German emplacements, including an 88mm gun, devastates the struggling infantry, and within a matter of minutes, 65 Canadian soldiers lay dead or wounded on the beach. On the far eastern end of Juneau, elements of the North Shore Regiment, landing in front of saint aubin sur mer are faced with a similar predicament as ferocious fire coming from undamaged German positions atop the town's high seawall annihilate the regiment's supporting tanks within a matter of minutes. Meanwhile, the arrival of reinforcements changes the tide of battle at bernier sur mer as the decimated men of the Queen's Own manage to overcome the Germans and move into the town. While the infantry are finding ways to move inland, increasingly agitated tank crews are finding it impossible to traverse the high-curved seawall. As engineers race against time to create makeshift ramps and open other exits off the landing zone, the beach is quickly becoming congested with the incoming tide. In the meantime, advancing Canadian infantry are moving to outflank the last pockets of German resistance. Corsol, Bernier, and saint aubin sur mer all fall under Canadian control. By 10 o'clock, the advance southward is ready to begin in Ernst. Within an hour, the Quebecois regiment stands outside the outskirts of Beni Sumer, while follow-up waves equipped with bicycles rush down to catch up with the vanguard. On the western flank, the Canadian Scottish and Winnipeg rifles link up in the marshes around saint croix sur mer while the Regina rifles and 1st Hussars advance towards the Rivier. With their line broken, the defenders of the 716th Infantry Division are powerless to withstand the weight of the Canadian advance. With the fall of Beni Sumer, the road to Capiquet Airfield and the Paris Cherbourg railway line now lay wide open. However, just as follow up units continue to advance southward, the eastern flank is attacked by elements of the 21st Panzer Division. Attempting to push the Allies back into the channel, the 21st's Panzers drive in between the Canadian and British lines toward the sea. The attack, however, fails to dislodge the Allies, and the 3rd Infantry Division recontinue the advance in hopes of reaching their primary objectives before nightfall. Dashing ahead, elements of the 1st Hussars manage to sever the Khan Bayou Highway while the North Nova Scotia Highlanders and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers fight their way into the towns of Villon, Busson, and Anisi. With the Canadians now a mere 5 kilometers away from the Capiquet airfield, its garrison panics and initiates a haphazard evacuation. Unbeknownst to the Germans, the 3rd Infantry Division receive orders to halt the advance and dig in for the night and prepare for another expected German counterattack. By the end of D-Day, the men of the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division had established a beachhead that stretched around 16 kilometers inland, which was further than any of the other beaches on the first day of the invasion. In return for this remarkable feat, its men had suffered serious losses during their initial landings on the beach, 
which were dwarfed only by the casualties the Americans sustained on Omaha. However, the Canadians had fallen short of their primary objectives. Their failure to capture the Kapike airfield in particular would soon prove to have been a costly mistake. By the end of the next day, powerful German reinforcements in the form of the 12th SS Panzer Division, Hitler Jugend, moved into the area, marking the start of a month-long bitter struggle which would not end until Kapike was finally captured on July 9th. 